And welcome, welcome, welcome to our panelists. So uh, Jeff Hill is the director of the Election Security Initiative at the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. And we have Kim Wyman, who is the senior election security advisor at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. So welcome, Jeff and Kim. Um, we're looking forward to your updates today, and then, of course, to any questions that the members might have. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Megan. It is uh, is really an honor to be here. Uh, appreciate you and Amy inviting us. And uh, I can tell you, uh, all of you members of NASA, that uh, Amy and Megan do a very good job of keeping us in the loop and letting us know when we might be getting off track. Okay. It's going to be a tough room here. Okay, it's after lunch. We're going to connect and everything. Um, I have to tell you a moment of personal privilege. It is really an honor to be here. I've always considered NASA, even though I was never a member, um, my you know kindred spirit organization, I was a, a member of NAS, and NASA is fantastic. But uh, let's face it, election directors are the ones who get the job done and do the work and get in the trenches and all. And, and everything you said, Megan, I totally agree with. And it's so... Um, um, good to just be around all of you and be reminded why we're doing this work and getting our second win because we got some big stuff coming ahead and we're ready for it. And uh, we can't lose sight of it and can't let all of the chatter um, discourage us because um, what you all do is so important and you do it well and you lead your states in a way that makes me proud to be a, an election person. And everybody that knows me knows I cry. So I got that out of my system right away. So we're good. Um, but uh, Jeff and I today want to to start by uh, just sharing an overview of CISA and what we uh, what we do and uh, the services that we can provide for you and uh, what may be hopefully useful in advance of the midterm um, elections. And go ahead. Uh, so. Some of you have been in your positions for a while, but 10 of you are brand new. So hopefully for those of you who are new, uh, you'll learn some things. And for those of you who've been around for a while, hopefully we can refresh your memories of, of some of the services and uh, resources that we provide at CISA. So first and foremost, CISA um, coordinates with the intelligence community, federal law enforcement, and private industry partners to provide alerts and information to inform all of you um, on with information that helps you manage risk in your states and make good risk-based decisions. Um, this includes technical cybersecurity alerts for your network defenders, as well as hosting regular classified and unclassified elec election threat briefings. CISA funds the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which supports state and local government broadly, and the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and I'll refer to both of those from now on as the MSISAC and the EIISAC. Um, CISA and the EIISAC also holds, host in-person and virtual si situational awareness rooms to facilitate real-time information sharing on key election dates. I also want to encourage you to please report cybersecurity incidents and anomalies um, on your networks and systems. This may not only be helpful for you, because CISA and the EIISAC uh, may be able to support you with your incident response, if requested, but it's also very important to us, our federal partners, and the broader election community, as we can use your reporting to investigate whether your issue is impacting other jurisdictions, and to inform our understanding of the, the evolving threat landscape. Additionally, CISA provides voluntary no-cost cybersecurity services to all critical infrastructure sectors, including state and local government and elections. These range from our highly scalable vulnerability scanning services to more in-depth offerings like penetration testing and our critical product evaluation program, which Jeff is going to talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. We fund the MS and EIISAC to provide additional no-cost services, including malicious domain blocking and reporting and endpoint detection and response. CISA also has a whole catalog of customizable, tailored, what we call last mile products that seek to help election officials raise security awareness among staff and communicate their security practices to the voting public. 
These include our popular Election Emergency Response Guide, which is a poster that each of you can place throughout your offices, and it gives your staff information uh, that might be crucial in an incident response, um, whether you're responding to a cybersecurity incident or another emergency. And we also have forward deployed field staff in all 50 states, including cybersecurity and protective security advisors who can provide trainings, assessments, and risk management guidance on cybersecurity and physical security issues in your state. Notably, our protective uh, security advisors can perform physical security assessments on election offices, storage facilities, voting centers, county locations, um, the things that you're, you and your locals are using every day. And this can give you a detailed set of recommendations to improve the physical security posture of your facilities. And I want to thank Amy for highlighting our PSAs and this core um, service during your last conference. All right. Now, you may recall that we, um, we have a program called CrossFeed, and this was originally piloted in a handful of states in 2020, but I'm here to tell you it's available right now for all of you. We currently have 19 states uh, that are using the service, and we'd really love that number to grow, and of course, election officials by our nature are competitive. So, you know, if you want to be in the cool club and have CrossFeed, I, I'm here to help. Um, relying on open source information, CrossFeed gives your network defenders a dashboard that presents near real-time uh, snapshots of the vulnerabilities identified in your internet-facing uh, assets. So this is like seeing your networks through your adversary's eyes and seeing what, what they're seeing out there. Um, from the, from the attacker's perspective. Um, it can, let's see, oh my goodness. Bear with me for a moment. I got my slide, my stuff off. <laughs> oh, okay. Crossfeed, let's see. Oh, there we go. Perhaps, most beneficially, multiple states have configured this dashboard to include information on their local election offices' internet-facing internet assets as well, enabling the state offices to alert their local partners uh, more quickly of newly identified vulnerabilities. So if your state hasn't already done so, please consider signing up for CrossFeed services to elevate your vulnerability um, identification of your public-facing assets. I also want to draw your attention to CISA's resources on insider threat mitigation, including a recently produced product that, target, that is targeted toward election infrastructure stakeholders. Regardless of your organization and the type of operations you manage, everyone can be vulnerable to insider threats. Individuals entrusted with access, incident response plans, um, investigation for registration, oh boy. Okay, I'm still good. Um, I am sorry. I am having just technical difficulties because I apparently can't read. Let's see. <laughs> Let me try that all over again. Okay, so ins insider threat mitigation. Um, this is uh, something that we all face, and it, you can have uh, threats to your critical assets at times can introduce to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of those systems and information. Insider threat mitigation is nothing new in the world of elections, and I'm sure that each one of your offices and your local offices have been building in processes, policies, and procedures to protect against uh, insider threats, to detect them, and obviously deter election officials from engaging in harmful activity. Our new guide and a companion training that we're now offering seeks to help you identify ways to improve your existing insider threat mitigation practices. Ryan Macias will be giving a preview of this um, training later today. And as with all of our trainings, we're thrilled to offer this training for your office or at the next convening of your local officials, election officials in your, st in your state. And I also want to make sure that everyone is aware of the upcoming National Tabletop the Vote exercise. It'll be held this year on August 17th, 18th, and 19th. And this is our fifth year hosting the exercise. It's a great opportunity for you and your states to test your incident response plans. Um, invitations uh, have been already sent out, and uh, the registration does close on July 22nd. 
Um, this year's exercise will include scenarios that reflect the evolving security challenges facing election officials, including physical security incidents and insider threats. As with past years, each state election office gets to decide who in their state to in invite and participate in the exercise. And when possible, we of course encourage you to include your local offices and other agencies in your state that may be involved in incident response, including state and local law enforcement, your election crime coordinators from the FBI and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. And I want to really give a sh shout out to Amy and those of you who have served or lent your staff to serving on the planning committee for this year's exercise. I want to reiterate that CISA can facilitate state-based exercises for you at no cost upon request and offers no-cost trainings on various topics. Both our exercises and trainings can be conducted virtually or in person. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jeff Hale. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Hey, y'all. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I, I've really missed meeting you all in person. Uh, for those new to NASED, uh, again, I'm Jeff Hale. Uh, I led our uh, election security initiative, our election security uh, work here at uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Really, uh, we've gone through a list of core capabilities, services uh, that, that we provide. I'll continue to go on that. But our role is to be your risk management partner. Uh, and we rely on uh, on a government coordinating council, which several several of you uh, have sat on. We really turn to your NASA president, uh, to and both in Michelle and Megan and Keith, uh, all the way back to Bob, and uh, uh, to help uh, identify what risks we can help serve you with. Uh, so this uh, this product uh, is one example. Uh, tomorrow morning you'll be hearing uh, about. Uh, efforts to reach hard to reach communities. And that was something that, that many of you all raised to us early in the process. I, I want to thank you all for being at the state level, uh, really strong partners. But we recognize that a lot of the security incidents are occurring at local levels. So how do we partner with you all uh, to help uh, advance the security ball at a, at a local jurisdiction level uh, across states across the country? So this is one. Uh, a new last mile product we call all of our, our last mile initiatives, our, our efforts to, to work through states to reach locals, the last mile. Uh, and here is one where many of you have raised that uh, physical security concerns uh, and threats to election officials uh, continue to be your top priority. Uh, so we were looking to find a, a product that we can tailor to each jurisdiction to help identify uh, reporting protocols what the threat statues are in, uh, in, in each jurisdiction uh, so that we can make this easy for you, for your locals, and the public uh, to have a really repeatable way of ensuring that th appropriate threats are reported. Uh, we're happy to make these for you, produce uh, several posters, put them up publicly, put them up in your election offices. Uh, just engage us at the email below uh, so that we can get started. All right. Um, Oh, an, another news item. <laughs> uh, we, in uh, early June, we released a coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, I know that this is one of the first, one of, not the first, uh, CVDs or coordinated vulnerability disclosures in the election sector. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to help familiarize you with the process. This is something that is very standard in uh, cybersecurity and support to other critical infrastructure sectors. Uh, but understanding that, um, that election security and that the election subsector is, uh, is very unique. Uh, we are obviously open to opportunities to tailor uh, and, and take the, the benefits of this practice uh, and make them uh, best use for you all. So uh, largely the, per the intent of a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program is to uh, take the expertise of security researchers uh, and help to direct it in a beneficial manner. Uh, so the purpose is when security researchers have believe they have discovered a vulnerability, how can they effectively communicate that with appropriate vendors and allow the vendors to actually demonstrate the security of their systems? Um, the release in uh, early June, well, there's never an ideal time to say some systems are vulnerable. I do think is it actually is actually a very ideal. Um, example of uh, of this uh, 
for the sector because so many of you have in your existing policies and, and, uh, and procedures the existing controls in place to help mitigate the vulnerabilities that were identified. So largely, we don't know that this will be a, uh, an ongoing role for CISA in support of the election sector, but this is something that we do for other critical infrastructure environments. Uh, and so researchers will, uh, will reach out to us uh, to identify particular vulnerabilities that they believe they've discovered. We will perform some measure of analysis to, to assess whether there's any technical merit to their cl claims. Uh, we will work with the vendor uh, and the researchers to identify which mitigations are in place, uh, how to apply them. Oftentimes it's release a patch, and Microsoft does this every single Tuesday. Uh, but in this sector, uh, there can be uh, other factors at play, certification, state testing, et cetera. Uh, so there were a lot of the physical sec security controls uh, in place for, uh, that we wanted to reflect in our advisory in early June. Um, in light of this, uh, we also want to promote that this doesn't have to be something coordinated at the federal government level. Uh, states, many states run their own coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs. Um, vendors can run their own vulnerability disclosure programs. Really, the role of the federal government should only be a last resort when things need to be escalated for critical infrastructure security purposes. Uh, but we've released a, a, a relevant guide to help implement any of those vulnerability disclosure programs uh, as you see appropriate. Um, in line with disclosing vulnerabilities, I want to highlight a particular in-depth service that we provide. Um, often out of our Idaho National Labs facility, uh, we take things like e-poll books and voting systems and do a truly in-depth down to shaving chip sh chipsets and, uh, and hot swapping components of the devices to, um, to understand how systems can, are really vulnerable, what level of risk lies in them, uh, and then uh, help the vendor to uh, proactively address those risks before they go through the certification process. But, so please talk to your vendors. For the vendors in the room, I know many of you have engaged with us on this and, and have expressed that, that you find value in this, uh, but want to continue to use this service for the for elections. Uh, Selfishly, I don't want to see it go to other types of critical infrastructure as much as I want to see uh, elections use this as much as possible. So please engage us. Uh, it's email us at vulnerability at cisa.dhs.gov uh, for the purpose of engaging in our critical product evaluation. Um, similarly, <laughs> they, these all have a vulnerability and risk management theme. That's my job. Uh, we've partnered with what we call the Sector Coordinating Council uh, to help articulate the supply chain risks to, um, uh, to the election sector. Uh, you've got a, a panel just after this, I believe, uh, discussing uh, many of the supply chain risk management features, but please take a look at the infographic that the Sector Coordinating Council uh, provide, or that produced. Uh, it covers hardware, software, services, and particularly paper supply chain issues. Um, we stand as your federal partner in helping to address these and mitigate these. Uh, we, for, we convene forums, bring experts in, uh, and can leverage the, the authorities of the federal government where appropriate. So uh, please take a look at the resources that we have, uh, the, the planning guidance that we do, and engage us on any real mitigations you need throughout the process. Similarly, it's as if we, uh, we were able to see the agenda, even though we weren't. Uh, <laughs> but we want to highlight that CISA um, has recognize the same need that you all do. Uh, how do you reach across language communities? Um, and many of you have actually challenged us in previous years to say that we had been producing all of our products only in English, uh, and that's not where all risk lies. So when trying to communicate, particularly when it comes to disinformation material or the security of election processes, uh, a need to serve non-English speaking communities. Uh, so thank you for that. Please note that we have released these products now in Spanish. We will continue to, to release our new materials uh, in, in Spanish and are looking to do it in other languages as well. Please see our election security library uh, at cisa.gov backslash election security library. Oh, that's good. Um, before we get to question and answer, uh, I do want to thank Amy. I want to thank Megan for your leadership. I want to thank Madison. This has been a, an incredible host uh, so, city so far. Um, I've never been here, so this is quite a treat. Um, 
I do want to familiarize with you all with our role. We are your risk management partners. Uh, this is not a random assortment of tasks and, uh, and services that we provide. This is what has been raised to us as areas of need. Uh, so if you have a challenge that we can help to address, please don't hesitate to ask. With that, happy to take questions. Great. Well, thank you both so much for again for being here, and just I, I think I can speak for all of us when I th say thank you just for being excellent partners um, in election security and administration. So thank you so much. Um, does anybody, any member, have a question for Kim or Jeff? Judd. Yeah, I have a. Quick question for Jeff. So, um, on the co coordinated vulnerability disclosures, if um, is the typical origin of that a researcher that comes to you, and can it be someone else? Is there are there restrictions in the way that that sort of organically or less organically happens? So, the typical process is a security researcher identifying this. If you have cause to identify a vulnerability in the software uh, and are not a security researcher, we're happy to take that and, and, and help you uh, work this to disclose. Uh, the unique aspect of, uh, of early June's disclosure was its relation to a court case. Uh, so this should not be used as, a, as necessarily the example uh, of how coordinated vulnerability disclosure uh, occurs in all instances. Um, because that was a, definitely a constraining factor. Um, but for anyone who identifies a vulnerability, uh, the first order is often to engage the, the vendor themselves. Um, if that is not working, then they go through a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process. I know our federal partners uh, at the EAC uh, have anomaly reporting and other things. We're happy to integrate with them as appropriate. Um, and really, when it comes to engaging the federal apparatus, we're happy to both direct this as appropriate to, to whichever federal agency can support you best in that. Hello, thanks for being here. We just saw you in Ohio, Kim. Thank you for coming to our local election official conference. It was great to have you and Director Easterly there. Um, I want to emphasize one thing um, that I heard that was a little startling. Um, only 19 states are utilizing crossfeed. I can, you know, speak from personal experience to my colleagues. If you're not using it, you really should be. It's an incredible um, resource and it's free. And if you have questions, you should ask Jeff and Kim about it. But, you know, we're happy to share our experience in Ohio and how valuable this tool is and really want to commend uh, Kim, Jeff, and Director Easterly for continuing its service. Um, really, really appreciate that. My question um, really hits on, you know, CISA's resources. You know, in Ohio, we, we use you guys a lot. Um, we pretty much take advantage of everything that you have to offer, and we force every single one of our boards of elections to take advantage of everything that you guys offer, which we're very proud of. But that there comes a point, you know, in any agency where, you know, how do you sustain that? How do you uh, continue to not only have the human resources to, you know, sustain the resource, the, the amazing resources that you're offering the states and locals? Um, and then as more states continue to take advantage of those, is there a strategic plan for the agency going forward? Ooh, that last line is a weighty one. Um, uh, so. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the, the kudos. And please take advantage of, of CISA's uh, no-cost voluntary services if you are not. Um, the challenges like Ohio's 88 counties wanting risk and vulnerability assessments, which are these intense uh, two-week, we deploy teams uh, and put them on site. They're on your networks, uh, testing, uh, uh, in-depth penetration testing. Um, not every jurisdiction is going to benefit from receiving a report like that. Uh, so we've really encouraged um, a measure of uh, a maturity model in, in receiving CISA services. Um, uh, first, the highly scalable uh, vulnerability scanning. Uh, things like using CrossFeed's um, uh, vulnerability management dashboard to help see insight into your 
uh, local jurisdictions, your county jurisdictions, um, uh, internet facing vulnerabilities. Uh, and then we like to uh, start to scale uh, the more um, resource intensive uh, services. One area that's really benefited us, every year we'll produce a trends analysis document of what are the, f the common findings we've seen across our service to election officials in that last year. And sometimes that's a cookie cutter approach to uh, a, a jurisdiction in one state. Uh, their state network is gonna look very similar to a, a, a state network um, or a, in several other states. So we like to provide this document. We, we release it in January so that there's time to implement any of those changes. Um, and then when your counties ask for services, we like to first promote this document and say, have you managed against these top 10 vulnerabilities seen against your colleagues and peer groups? Uh, and if so, if you are taking that, ma that mature step, that's when we, we advance to, uh, to the higher level services like validated architecture design review, some of the remote penetration testing, the, the risk and vulnerability assessment. But continue to test us. Use us as much as you want. And just, I, I'm kind of the new, the new, one of the newer team members uh, at CIS, and, and I can tell you when I was at the Secretary of State's office, Lori Agino and Stuart were able to build out some pretty amazing things, very much like what Mandy's talking about in Ohio, um, in in their in their offices because of this partnership with CISA. And for those of you who are new to your jobs, if you're not familiar, uh, that critical infrastructure designation that happened in 2017 is the game changer and is what what opens up all of these resources for all of you to uh, to your states and to your locals. And I really, as a former election official, encourage you, if you're not familiar, to get familiar with what we have because we, we are here to level the playing field. Um, let's face it, I think we're all acutely aware of not only are you all fighting, let's see, Russia, China, Iran, uh, some domestic actors, you still have elections to run. And um, this helps level the playing field because you can bring the, the resources of the federal government into your state and now you can you know, have a, a, you know, a big, what do I say, a big brother. No, that's a bad example. Um, never mind, bad. strike that if you could from the, the video. But you know, have, having somebody on your team that, uh, that can fight the fight at that higher level. So, um, but as Jeff said, these are voluntary and they are no cost to you. So we invite you and I encourage you to, to see what we can do for you. Great, any other questions? I have a couple, but want to make sure if anybody has anything else. Well, not as much a question, but a uh, um, respectful suggestion. And it's been a number of years now since I was able to do the um, TTX. And unfortunately, I can't this year either because it's just the two days after the primary. <clears throat> but thinking back to it, when I did do it a couple of years ago, the sort of main suggestion that we had coming out of that was if the follow-up questions that were sort of the bottom half of the pages could better relate to the injects that are the top half of the pages. I remember feeling numerous times where we'd go through the injects and kind of then have a lot that we wanted to talk about to debrief on those, and the, the follow-up questions below didn't seem to pull out those conversations about the, the facts that were, that were the injects. Simple, minor suggestion. Otherwise, you guys, those TTX um, exercises are great, and I highly suggest um, taking part if you can. This is a great opportunity to continue to um, ask for your participation in the uh, election uh, planning team, or the exercise planning team. Um, so we really solicit across uh, the security community, uh, the, uh, the vendor community, uh, across uh, election officials, inputs on uh, what would make these exercises uh, most effective. Uh, I, do th I appreciate that. Um, I think that the Tabletop to Vote has grown so much uh, from its first in 2017. Uh, uh, from many of our, our election partners not having an incident response plan uh, to many of us, many people now saying, uh, you guys got to test us harder because this is getting easy. Um, so uh, happy to take whatever feedback you have on, on how to improve Tabletop to Vote. 
and our, our particularly our services to you all directly in state level exercises. Great. Okay. Thanks to both of you. You've been very supportive and always appreciate working with you. Um, actually, probably shouldn't because if I'm calling you, Jeff, it's not a good day. But, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, uh, you're always so supportive. Um, given the critical infrastructure designation, our funding has off thus far has come to, to address security measure, measures um, have has come through the HAVA funding. Do y'all, and I know there's no crystal ball for this, but do you see a, a horizon that includes funding that would come more through CISA so that we could directly address security ma matters um, from Homeland Security side more so um, than you know having to balance it with voter registration systems and um, voting equipment and, and training and so forth? Is do you foresee more separation of those pots of money um, for elections? Oh, it's an excellent question. Um, I, I will say that historically, CISA has not been a, um, a grant administrator. We have now been uh, been uh, we are starting a cyber security, state and local cybersecurity grant. Um, now that's not an election security grant, but we are trying to reflect the interests of uh, of this critical state and local government community. Uh, amid the, the cybersecurity concerns there. Um, we also know that in the Homeland Security Grant Program, uh, election security was designated as a national priority, but I have heard from lots of you that access to those funds have been difficult. Uh, so we're constantly looking to improve our ability to, uh, to connect you into federal resources. Um, and, uh, and frankly, um, we have seen tremendous value in the Help America Vote Act grants because of the role of, their, of the state level election offices in determining their use. Um, so we're huge advocates of our federal partners and their ability to, to, uh, to distribute those grants where possible. Any other questions? Please. Hello, Lauren from New Jersey. Um, Thank you as well for the partnership. I love the Spanish materials. Um, in New Jersey, we try to translate our flyers um, into 12 different languages. So this might be a little bit too early to ask, but what's the next planned language for translations? We are looking at, uh, at Mandarin and Chinese, um, but this was a multi-year process for us to address Spanish language. Um, so. Uh, we would welcome your feedback and your prioritization, uh, but this is the, the current order that we're planning. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Sorry, just a follow-up. Um, so thank you for that. Is, have you looked at or are you considering ways to make the templates flexible so that states could just conduct their own translation with translators they usually work with? That's an excellent. We have not considered that for um, for the, we do that for different services like Last Mile, um, but we've not considered that for producing our disinformation materials, but we'll definitely look at that as a model. Any other questions? John. Uh, so I'm interested in, in this critical product evaluation. Um, is it, it, does it work right now or will it work going forward where the elections administrator would work with the vendor to sort of put it in the position for you to do the evaluation? Is there a scenario where the vendor does it completely themselves and the, the state doesn't know about it or the state asks you to do it and the vendor doesn't know about it or some scenario like that? So currently, the vendors have been voluntarily engaging uh, with CISA and saying we want uh, to take advantage of these services. Um, it, it is a lengthy service, some between three to six months of testing uh, and reporting and then uh, helping to address any of the findings. Um, we have had some election officials, some state level election officials partner with their vendors and suggest I would like to ensure that these systems go through. Um, 
but at no point would we do this testing without the vendor's uh, participation. They're critical partners in this, uh, and they're the ones implementing the, the, the security changes. Um, so really, uh, part of this is aware, an awareness campaign to know that you can talk to your vendors about this type of testing, uh, but also um, be aware that they're already doing it with us in large part. Uh, uh, one question I had for you is looping back to the idea about the vulnerability disclosure program. I'm wondering if you all can share um, thoughts you have to publicize sort of the normalcy of that process, right? I think that a disclosure of a vulnerability is a positive thing. It's a thing that we want to see in the security community. Um, and I think that sometimes that positive part sort of gets lost uh, in these events. And so I was wondering if you had any ideas to share about how we help people understand that that's a good, normal, healthy part of uh, a security program. So that's an excellent uh, suggestion, and I wish I had a better way. I will say that CISA uh, alone uh, disclosed more than 1,200 vulnerabilities last year. Um, we've only done two vulnerability disclosures across the election sector. Uh, and so in large part, it is um, uh, a merging of, of two cultures, uh, a very cybersecurity focused uh, culture and an election security culture. Uh, that, that kind of pretends the uh, lack of familiarity uh, with vulnerability disclosure. Timing is the one that's most challenging with this sector. I would also like to ask, we made an assumption um, that the owners and operators of these uh, voting systems in this instance are, um, are largely county jurisdictions. Um, we notified state level entities. Um, we have strong partnerships with you all. We don't have the fidelity of information down to every local, so we wanted to partner with you all to, to engage your locals. Um, but that was an assumption that we were placing upon you all uh, that, that may not have been fair. So I would definitely welcome your feedback, doesn't have to be now, uh, on how we can improve this process to ensure that those potentially impacted entities have the information they need to mitigate risk to their systems while uh, at the same time uh, not adding more to your plate, if at all possible. Having you know been on on our on the CISA side through this uh, CVD, um, which was really fun, and I learned so much from it. And gosh, can't wait for the next one. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity for the SCC and the GCC to to really start talking about this. I think that um, that certainly when we were in the the middle of it trying to roll it out in this very thoughtful manner so we didn't blindside anyone and set all of you up for success um, it was bumpy in, in a couple of points there and uh, and on both uh, for vendors and for both um, end users and, and states so um, I think it would it would be a good place to, to maybe start those conversations of how do we move forward when these start coming in the future in in this community and and I think you're right Megan I think that it really does need to be the norm because it's good to find out there's a vulnerability so you can mitigate it so that you don't uh, you don't have someone taking advantage of it and getting into your system and doing something malicious. So I, I think we all want the same end and I, I think that uh, this was a good kickstart for it and I don't know when we're going to work that in with all the other things you all have to do, but I know we can do it. I think that's that's great, and thank you very much for that. It really does, you know, reflect. I think how this is a cooperative process, and we're always learning and trying to figure out how to better message things. So thank you, thank you for embracing that. Um, along, well similar lines, I guess, also speaking to the public and helping them understand how elections work and how to uh, wade through the mis and disinformation that they might be seeing. Uh, how will CISA be leveraging rumor control this year to help people navigate some of the misinformation um, about election systems and procedures? 
uh, carefully, I think, uh, would be my answer. Um, it, it is certainly top of mind. I know that uh, we were just in Austin and maybe even Ohio, I think the director talked about it publicly, um, that, that she would like to see the title of it change to something more along the lines of, and I'm totally blanking on her term, but, but getting away from rumor control, because even that kind of has a connotation that uh, information, that we're judging what that information is. And I think that given the events of the last six months in Department of Homeland Security with the um, Disinformation Governance Board, there's certainly... Um, you know, a caution uh, of how we're going to move forward. I know it's top of mind in in our shop of, of how do we move forward with MDM. We know how important that work is because we've heard from all of you. It's something that you deal with daily. My favorite quote comes from um, the Maricopa County recorder where he said that his daytime job is countering MDM and his evening job is running elections. And, um, you know, so we know that the need's there and we certainly want to provide you with resources so you can be the trusted sources in your community. So I think we will continue to be doing rumor control and be doing the work and giving products to all of you that you can leverage in your states. Um, but know that when we're doing this work, everything we do goes through our attorneys and goes through our policy um, folks to make sure that uh, we aren't as the federal government, we aren't trying to suppress free speech. And also, it's a really uh, interesting type rope that we're walking, but I know that uh, the, the conversations I've been privy to, uh, we plan to move forward and continue supporting you in that area. But. So one item that we received from, from feedback uh, from you all um, is really the role of state election officials and local election officials in being that trusted source of information. Uh, so we tried to um, help with, uh, with documenting our planning factors uh, for when we did rumor control, and the uh, Government Coordinating Council put out the uh, rumor control startup guide. Just what were the thresholds? How, what were the approaches for mitigating this? And we've seen many of yours predate our CISA's rumor control, but, but others have popped up since. Um, we've seen some excellent state-level um, debunking of uh, of misinformation. So uh, we're not in a position to be the one trusted source, but we are here to support you all uh, in this. So where there are opportunities for us to provide that uh, election security, civic voter education, we're here to do that. We've gotten the director's commitment that we will do rumor control, likely under a brand refresh, um, but uh, um, we will continue, much like we did in 2020, uh, to support you where possible. And most importantly is our ability to point back to your pages uh, and advance you all uh, as trusted sources of information throughout uh, uh, for election security. Thank you. Any other questions for Kim and Jeff? Judd? Sorry. Um, you're going to get used to this. I, uh, okay, so I have another question. Uh, the um, elections was uh, considered a priority in FEMA money this last year. Uh, the announcement was made the next morning. I was on the phone to our FEMA state coordinator, and he told me that I missed the deadline. Even though it was a 30-day, you gave us 30 days before the deadline. And the reason why we missed the deadline was because uh, the state, it's broken up into 80-20, so 20% goes to the state, 80% goes to locals. Uh, the state money was already accounted for based on meetings that had been conducted at state level, and that regional meetings had already been conducted where they had identified what the spending priorities would be at the regions. So even though the actual formal deadline was 30 days away, all the internal work had already been done. So... Um, it looked like on paper we had time to submit for to propose to use that money that had been prioritized for elections, but practically speaking, we didn't have that. Um, so I have a three-part question. Uh, will we get more time? Will, will elections be a priority next year? Will we get more time? Will uh, the priority actually be a substantive amount? So 3%, 5%. Um, and if none of those you know come to pass uh is there uh, a plan to work with states to have uh a process in place where there's a more likely possibility that we could actually get that money 
I'm going to try to answer that in, in one <laughs> in one concise. So I need to collect your feedback on um, why whether you were able to, to access uh, Homeland Security Grant Program funds uh, and whether this structure, despite being a, a national security, identified as a national security priority, is not serving you. We will continue to advocate that election security uh, is a national security priority. Those decisions are made far above uh, our team, but you have our adv advocacy. Um, but the more we can show that whether the structure uh, is appropriately providing you the, the, the resources that you need, um, or, or if it's completely missing the mark, uh, we need that in order to bring it back and make change. Uh, so I, I have heard from Colorado on this one, but I haven't heard from other states. Uh, if, if you're not getting access to Homeland Security Grant Program funding and intended to and, and, and attempted to, please let us know. We're constantly looking to improve this. On that note, two years ago, elections were specifically put in there that they had some portion had to be. So that so our NEMA reached out to us. Now, subsequently, it's not either not in there or they can use it for elections. So they've gone silent because if they don't have to give it to elections, they're going to use it for other reasons. So. I think it was beneficial when they had to use it for elections, some portion, that way the, what, the missed deadline that Judd went into wouldn't have happened because they wouldn't have gotten any money if they wouldn't have submitted something for elections. That would have helped. And I guess, I don't know if Judd, that's kind of what you're running into too. The priority originally, the first time, is what how I got money, but they won't be asking me if it's a May. Only of a shell. So. Yep, absolutely. And uh, and the more uh, of your experiences we could get in, in formal feedback, uh, we can help to effectuate change. All right. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah. Please, Heidi. What kind of questions, comments together. Um, in Iowa, a few years ago, when we were uh, working to bolster our election cybersecurity administrative rules, we added to them that the county auditors uh, were required to request the risk and vulnerability assessments from CISA. And in Iowa, you have a tremendous lead in Chris Judge, and he uh, got to work in in trying to um, follow up with the counties as they requested. Well, so many of them, because it was a requirement, uh, requested it even though they didn't understand what they were requesting. Um, and so Chris reached out to CISA headquarters to say, hey, we're, we have 99 counties here and they all have to get this done. And headquarters came back and said, we can do about two or three a year. And that wasn't going to um, help the counties uh, comply with our administrative rules. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, one, Chris was really working hard and continues to work hard to go into the counties as they request them and first have a conversation with them about CISA services and talk to them about security. They would, uh, the county auditors would request the assessments. Chris would show up and say, okay, I'm here. And they would say, now what is this again? So he would spend time uh, working through that with them. But then they would need to work with their IT directors to uh, work through that assessment. And so, uh, one, um, the document that you referenced a little bit ago, Jeff, about um, what we can give to those local election officials to explain to them all of the CISA services, I think would be great. And what did you call that? Or does it have a title? So we have our last mile initiative uh, where we work at, at the state level to, to kind of give a checklist uh, of what you want and what we would like to advocate for, uh, for different locals to, to use. And Chris Judge is one of the best, uh, I'm sorry to everyone else, but uh, <laughs> uh, he is. <laughs> and so um, love to hear that approach. Uh, I would have, uh, I, I, 
steering Iowa counties towards, uh, although you have a great uh, chief information officer to office that provides a lot of the same services too, uh, but the vulnerability scanning, um, uh, things like phishing campaign assessments, um, ISAC membership, all of those first uh, before the, the in-depth two-week really uh, information heavy uh, uh, risk and vulnerability assessment um, is probably an area where we would have uh, attempt to steer, get those lower tiers first uh, so that we start to do the cyber familiarity, the cyber maturity um, before going into to something that we So do. we do include um, all of those items that you just listed as part of the administrative rules. And so we have all of the counties signed up for the ISACs. Um, there, we do monthly phishing assessments uh, with them and we even have the counties um, on their own, also uh, doing phishing assessments throughout all of their departments, not just the county auditors that are the local commissioners of elections. Um, so getting them to that risk and vulnerability assessment, uh, the one that is required, I think is like an eight hour day, or maybe it's a couple of eight hour days. Um, so we've had some pushback from them on that, that that takes a considerable amount of time and if they can have a little better understanding or their IT directors can have a little better understanding ahead of time of what kind of information would be required, um, then they can work through that a little more efficiently. But we've also tried to get the counties to understand this isn't something to be rushed also. Uh, it's not just a checklist of Chris asking questions and them spouting off answers real quickly. Um, it's to help them understand their cyber and physical security uh, concerns. And so one of the CSAs uh, last year actually got about 25 counties in a room together. I think it was for the county um, IT annual conference. And so they went through uh, something similar uh, to that assessment, kind of a mini assessment with the 25 counties in the room together and they appreciated that, um, but they also, uh, you know, each IT director has their own opinions and each no. one thinks their county's stronger or better than the other counties and why do they have to be included in the group conversation? But I wanted to um, just give Iowa um, CISA personnel a, a shout out because they're working so hard to um, help the counties comply with the administrative rules. And so this year we're working through some um, rewriting of that risk and vulnerability assessment portion. We're working very closely with Chris and um, whoever will be the next uh, CSA that they're bringing on board there um, to make it a little more manageable. And one of the things that we're looking at doing is um, getting them to have to accomplish a little more understanding of the CISA services as a whole and not just push them into that assessment, but get them to where they're comfortable with their cyber and physical um, security needs so that they can reach out to CISA when they're ready uh, to go through those assessments. And we use those last mile uh, posters. We've used those for several years now, and that's been a great tool, and I'm excited about the new um, product that you showed today. Um, but I thought you had mentioned another document, kind of a, um, smaller document that we can give to the counties that takes them through all of the various services that so, CIS offers or break it into categories. Did so we do, have, uh, we do have both uh, service catalogs as well as uh, kind of uh, leave behind cards for any of those. Uh, the, the review that you're talking about, Chris Judge doing is a cyber risk review, which is exactly that. And, and I really do want to promote uh, the engagement with your CISA regional staff because the purpose of those cyber risk reviews um, is to help determine which CISA services or services procured elsewhere uh, will be of value to you and really get you in that and get your counties thinking uh, in terms of um, the, the merging of operational election security with cybersecurity. I know you guys have all known the election operational security for, for years. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's the cybersecurity element that's an interesting overlay. Uh, so that's one of those services. It is an eight hour sit down and kind of lengthy checklist. Um, but uh, please do engage, encourage you all to engage uh, CISA, CISA field staff to, to understand the, the CRRs in that sense. 
Um, and happy, we do have a booth in the other room where a lot of the sample materials are. Um, if any of that would be, be useful, we can also customize them for your state. Well, Kim and Jeff, thank you so much again for being here, and thank you for taking the time to talk through all those questions, and thank you as always for your continued partnership, and I'm really glad that we had to, got a chance to kind of highlight some of that partnership here today, so thank you so much. Thank you all.